ジョー様の言っていた下のすごい迷路に着きました行きましょう Come on, baby, I just want out. I wish you could put me on your knee and take care of me. Oh, woohoo! That's a nasty glug! The Laughing Cavalier here, presenting to you another tale of these troubled times. Today, I present to you a preview of my next review, that being an examination of Ridley Scott's 2023 film Napoleon. You see, this review has become rather enormous at this point, and whilst it is nearing completion, I still have some ways to go with it. And then Scott dropped the director's cut. I have now finished the section on the DC. And thought it would be a good idea to release it separately as a preview of the main review, while also doubling up as a standalone mini review of said DC. Although, don't worry, it will still have its place in the main review. It has been a bit of a pain to get this one done, not least since I came down with a severe cough and headache during the making of it, and was recovering from said cough when recording it. My niece was probably responsible, but I'm blaming Ridley Scott for this, since I hate him. Because of this condition, my first attempt at recording didn't go so well. Despite numerous delays and real life events getting in the way, my Magnus. <coughs> <coughs> oh dear. I took a bit of a break, consumed a strepsil or two, and then I was well enough to proceed. Apologies if my voice sounds a little different in the recording, but I had more or less recovered by then, so I think it is fine. Please note, since this is meant to be in the main review, I do make several references to parts of it that won't make much sense out of context, but please do bear with me until I get the main review done. Anyway, no more delays, I give you my pain. This here is a special exclusive section just for this review. You see, back in late August, I was feeling pretty confident. Despite numerous delays and real life events getting the way, my Magnus Opus was nearing completion. I even started to do a bit more gardening again, since I felt I could relax. Not that it relaxes me, but I have to do it. But then, a noise was heard in the distance. As it got nearer, it became clear what it was clown music. And upon a cycle, there stood Ridley Scott, who, out of nowhere, dropped his oversized trousers, honked his nose, and delivered this. Hello, people of the internet. This is Ridley Scott speaking. I'm thrilled to announce that Napoleon, the director's cut, is now exclusively on Apple TV. Oh, man. Oh, God. Oh, man. This came as a surprise to most, since the news had basically been that this director's cut would never see the light of day. And even its release was like a parent abandoning an unwanted child. The trailer was released the same day as the director's cut. There was no build up, and the only leak we had was a report stating that it had been submitted for rating. That was it. Why it was released now will remain a mystery. Fortunately, as you heard, I had sort of accounted for this in the intro. But once I actually watched the damn thing, I knew I had to at least somewhat cover it. Rather than starting from scratch, though, I kept the stuff you have just watched, but will now use this one off section. To specifically go through what was added in the director's cut and whether it improved the movie. <laughs> uh, keep in mind my predictions from the Tai Dobhid segment. The director's cut is 48 minutes longer than the theatrical, and boy, do you feel every excruciating second of it. When watching it, I initially thought about half of the 48 minutes were just extra shots of things like people firing muskets and so on. I was curious though. And, being a complete masochist, I put both versions into the timeline next to each other so I could pick out the scenes that were actually added. To my surprise, there were actually none that were additional bits like I thought. I could have sworn there was a new added shot or two here with Marie Antoinette's execution, but no. Taking out the opening logos, the first new scene doesn't appear until 15 and a half minutes into the movie, not counting a little bit of changed dialogue. Going further, 
I then went full investigation mode and drew up a spreadsheet detailing what scenes were added, what length they were and so on. I have not been thorough though, and of course it is more like new sequences, since, for example, this one here has about three different new scenes that come one after the other, and I have been a bit lax in how I differentiate new scene and extended scene. Broadly though, taking away any new logos and bits in the end credits, we get just over 47 minutes of new footage. Nearly 19 minutes of this is in the first hour. The second hour has nearly 13 and a half, the third hour nearly 13 minutes, and the last half hour has barely two. The longest new scene is nearly six minutes long. The shortest is barely 15 seconds. There is only one alternate angle used in the movie, right at the end, where some British troops are observing the Poland on St Helena. As you can see, the first hour is the one that got more attention. I also colour-coded the scenes, so light orange is new Josephine scenes with her and no Napoleon. Light blue means Napoleon with no Josephine, and purple is scenes with both of them. White ones are scenes with neither. The first hour scenes are definitely more focused towards Josephine. The longest scene is mainly focused on her, save for one bit which we will get onto later. And even the Napoleon scenes here aren't that long, including the shortest 15 second one. By the middle of the film, it is getting more focused on Napoleon, and then, once he divorces her, it's more Napoleon again. But that can be deceiving, since the only really lengthy new sequences here are in Russia. In an interview, Ridley Scott said the director's cut would have way more Josephine, and he wasn't lying. Austerlitz and Waterloo get basically no new scenes. I will now briefly go over what was added although I am afraid this will take a while. The first sequence is the longest scene, where Hortense is being interrogated about her family, just after her father's arrest, since they want to arrest Josephine here as well. A side note, after the interrogator threatens to hurt Hortense, Josephine says, so She is five years old. Which she isn't. She's about ten. In fact, really, she should be nearer eleven, since it was March 1794 when her father was arrested, not September 1793, which is a month before Marie Antoinette is executed, and three before the Toulon scenes, meaning we have been doing a bit of time travelling. What is it we're getting basic facts wrong like this? Anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to go into so much detail there. Then, Josephine in prison. She's shown around, told she should cut her hair short so it doesn't mess with the blade of the guillotine, and also that she should try to get pregnant to postpone her potential execution. Then, a brief scene of the Carmelite nuns being executed. Again though, this event was in July, not April. Next, Robespierre's execution is actually shown. Then a much extended sequence of Josephine leaving prison after avoiding the guillotine route. <laughs> Walking home very slowly, and reuniting with her children, before back to Napoleon and Juno decided to go to the survivor's ball, which now includes the most annoying sound ever heard by human ears. I was forever trapped in an infinite timeline of pain and suffering. I envy death. Bara now gets a scene with Josephine, where we actually learn she was having an affair with him, as historically happened, and that he encouraged her to get with Napoleon. An extended scene of Napoleon waiting around Josephine's house. DeVoe is introduced a bit earlier, singing Le Chant du Depart. Napoleon's conquest of Italy is now ever so briefly shown, but it's just him riding through Milan, uh, side note here, I think they CGI'd the uh, backgrounds a bit differently, as this shot was in the trailer and it's clearly a battle scene, but hey ho. He then goes into a cathedral and tells the local bishop he is nicking all of the artwork. There is an extended scene from the theatrical of Napoleon and Josephine in bed before he leaves for Egypt. Not one, but two new extra scenes of Josephine's affair with Hippolyte Charles. The 15 second shot when Napoleon arrives back in France from Egypt. Napoleon apologizing to Josephine's maid after he threw a tray out of her hand, and then he is comforted by her. Hour 2 has some more scenes of the planning for the Brumaire coup. A brief scene of Napoleon as first consul deciding on new uniforms and signing decrees. A slightly extended scene of Napoleon and Josephine at a reception. The Battle of Marengo. Oh, I can't wait to rant about that one. The attempted assassination of Napoleon, and then the execution of the Duc d'Angine. Uh, just a state here. Whilst it was good to have this scene, instead of just having a bomb go off, we have a hilarious sequence where a 
flaming wagon is driven right into Napoleon's carriage. That no one noticed until it was right there. Oh, and Angine quotes Ney commanding his own firing squad for some reason. Despite this, it was at least a scene that should have been left in. However, from this point on, it's where the additional scenes really start to go off the rails. We have a scene after Napoleon becomes Emperor, where he meets with Hippolyte Charles, Josephine's former lover, and asks how he can pleasure her to get a son. And then the only additional Austerlitz scene is Napoleon sitting on the loo, then washing his face, and then getting an aide to rub him down like a horse, whilst his soldiers sit in a barn. Like a horse. Didn't that movie used to have a war in it? Come on, yep, you've been warned. Hour 3 continues with the last of the new Josephine scenes, where Eugène reads out the divorce terms to her. Tsar Alexander I and one of his ministers discuss leaving the continental system. Napoleon's troops, on the way to Moscow, find a sleigh. It is really important they set up that they found a sleigh. Napoleon, on the way back from Russia, is told he has piles. The second longest new scene involves Kulenkor urging Napoleon to leave the army in the ever so important sleigh from earlier, which he does with just two guards. Meanwhile, the soldiers have all crammed into a barn to escape the cold, but a random bit of fire that was just burning on the straw here, not even on a hearth or anything, catches something else on fire, I think maybe some gunpowder spreads it, and the whole barn ignites like it is covered in petrol. Meanwhile, Grumpy Napoleon is doing his best impression of downfall. This is a triumphant return. I am the victor. Mit dem Angriff Steiners. And rides over the Borodino battlefield. Two new and extended scenes on Elba, with a local boy shining his boots, the Poland getting even more angry over Josephine seeing the Tsar, and the Poland's mother saying he looked a bit sad. A brief scene of Louis XVIII fleeing Paris, getting even further humiliated than the theatrical. Perhaps the people will let me go. As they let him come. That scary looking clown at the end of my bed would go away. Napoleon lying in Josephine's bed after her death, and then the only new scene for Waterloo, in the theme of our slits, is Napoleon looking into the toilet at his bloody piles. The last half an hour only has a slightly longer conversation between Wellington and Napoleon, and then Napoleon showing Betsy Balcom on St. Helena how to hold a sword. Apologies for exhausting everyone's attention but I thought I'd better lay out just what was added, and how pointless most of it all is. Of these scenes, I would say about four or five add to the film. Number one, the Carmelite nun's execution. Whilst I would actually cut out the Josephine stuff and introduce her like she is in the theatrical, perhaps keeping her reuniting with the children, although props to the young actress playing Hortense One, who actually got some lines compared to the theatrical, the scene of the nuns being guillotined is one that should have been left in. Historically, this particular group of nuns from Compiègne were executed in July of 1794, and, as they waited their turn, they all chanted in Latin. Each time the blade fell, the crowd grew less and less vocal, until, when the last one's heads had fallen, they were dead silent, shocked at what they had just witnessed, as is shown in the film. Hands. Are we the baddies? It was not the only event, but it was one that certainly made it apparent to many that the terror had gone too far, and it contributed to Robespierre's downfall weeks later. In the theatrical, we go straight from Napoleon winning at Toulon to Barat just telling him people are no longer supporting the terror. Here, we actually get to see it. There are some finer details that are wrong. The last nun being executed looks like she is little more than a teenager, when the youngest was in her mid-twenties. Some errors with the guillotine and so on. But the gist of it is there. And the young actress here, played by... Uh, 
Oh, wait, I don't know who it is. Um, let me just grab a dice here. Number three, Aenea Marson does a decent job of showing bravery, whilst also showing some glimpses of fear when she presumably glances up at the blade. She certainly shows more emotion than Joaquin Phoenix. You think you're so great because you have boats! Number two, Josephine and Barra's affair. This should have been left in, since it establishes just why Josephine went for Napoleon. Historically, Barra wanted to make a connection with Bonaparte, whilst also fobbing off an expensive mistress. Without this scene, we just assume that Josephine likes him, I guess? Which wasn't quite true at this stage. Number three, the planning for the Brumaire coup. In the theatrical, we go from CAs talking to Napoleon about how they're going to launch a coup to overthrow the directory straight to said coup. Here, we get two new scenes where CAs is in the room with the plotters, where they go into a bit more detail regarding how the events will play out. Then, a scene that night where Lucien and Napoleon basically agree that the latter is merely using the other plotters to gain power for himself, before, finally, he tells Josephine that, by tomorrow, he will be First Consul. Whilst the last bit with Lucien and Josephine had some bad dialogue choices, overall, this was a good change that further fleshes out exactly how Napoleon took over, and this should definitely have been left in the theatrical. Perhaps a bit less of the why is here, since, of course, Mr. Scott has decided to focus the movie on Josephine rather than Napoleon, but this is a part that should definitely have been left in. Number four, the assassination attempt and the execution of the Duc d'Angin. A quick note here. These two events happened quite a few years apart. The plot of the Rue saint Lacaise, depicted here, happened in December 1800, whereas the Duc d'Angin was executed in March 1804 for a separate conspiracy. However, given the other mistakes of the film, this is low down the list, since at least we get the important point of royalists are trying to kill Napoleon, and Angine gets executed as a result. In the same way that Cromwell, just having Parliament get recalled, rather than depicting the short and long Parliaments, is fine, given that it only had a couple of hours to show the whole of the English Civil War. As mentioned earlier, despite the comical version of the Machine Infernal, this event, and Angine's execution, should definitely have been shown. His effective kidnapping and murder from a neutral country shocked Europe. It was a factor that led to the formation of the Third Coalition against France, and the event made Napoleon seem tyrannical. Even if Napoleon tried to make peace after this, the event had already sealed his reputation amongst many of the crowned heads of Europe for years to come. Number 5. Tsar Alexander I and a minister discuss leaving the continental system. In the theatrical, we go straight from Josephine seeing Napoleon's son to the Emperor suddenly declaring, I now have to invade Russia because something about Russia not trading with us. Here, we do actually get to see a scene where the Tsar is in discussion with one of his ministers, who I do not think gets a name or credit, but at least Toothless Female Warden did though. Let's just call this fellow Bob. Interestingly, pretty much all of the movie is in English, save for one scene where Talleyrand briefly speaks in German with the Austrian ambassador, and then this scene, which is entirely in Russian. Bob tells the Tsar that what is good for Napoleon cannot be good for Russia, and that trade with Britain is necessary to make Russia great. Bob also tells Alexander that his father made a serious error by putting himself above Russia, and he does not want to see the Tsar becoming unpopular. Alexander responds that he is not his father, and tells Bob never to make that mistake again. He then says he will realign with the British, and that he is not afraid of Napoleon. Next to the Carmelite scene, this is probably one of the most necessary that should have been left in. Firstly, we actually get the justification for why Russia leaves the continental system, and why Napoleon thus invades. Without it, we just cut from Josephine to the invasion as stated before. Secondly, we also get to look at the Tsar's character further. His father, Tsar Paul, was overthrown and murdered in a palace coup. Here we see his fear that if he fails in his duty to his people, a similar fate might await him, hence why he has to prove himself, and standing up to Napoleon seems like a good way of doing so. As stated earlier, I do think the actor playing the Tsar was quite decently cast, so at least we got a bit more of him, and less of wheezing and croaking Joaquin Phoenix, who seemed to have the energy of Torgo. I'll get the, the luggage. Well... That is it. Every other scene should have either been heavily redone or left on the cutting room floor completely. The battles are not extended, 
save for Austerlitz and Waterloo, both having new sequences of Napoleon on the loo. Why? The only new battle is Marengo, and it is a complete joke. We get a map scene where DeVoe and others tell Napoleon where the Allied armies are, apparently including a French royalist army somewhere around Brittany and the Vendée, even though Napoleon had long since met a ceasefire with the remnants of those forces, most of which had been crushed several years earlier. All we see of the actual Battle of Marengo is the scene from the trailer, except it is flipped the right way now, with the addition of an Austrian grenadier getting his head cut off by Napoleon's sword. That's it. You might as well have just cut the scene completely, since it basically serves no purpose. No one mentions the importance of the victory, and it is never brought up again. Hell, Waterloo mentioned Marengo more. Everything depends on one big battle, just like at Marengo. But at Marengo, I was young. I've been in this position before at the Battle of Marengo. I lost the battle at five o'clock, but I won it back again at seven! And then the sheer amount of scenes related to Josephine. The chart can be deceiving, since even though we start to get more Napoleon scenes as the movie progresses, some of them are still related to her. The worst has to be when Napoleon meets with Hippolyte Charles and asks how he can get his wife pregnant. I, I need to think. Yes, I suppose you'll have to do the thinking for both of us now, darling. It is such a long and unnecessary scene. We could have had the Battle of Vienna, but instead we got that. We could have had Eilau, but instead we got Napoleon mumbling in a sleigh. We could have had Leipzig, but instead we got Napoleon giving Betsy Balcom some fencing techniques. Oh, and we got some new additions to the cringe dialogue section. He's a filthy Bourbon weasel who, who, who will be punished! I wish you could put me on your knee and take care of me. Overall, there is not much more to say. A few bits of music are changed, the occasional bit of narration and costumes look okay, but the criticisms of the theatrical still stand. This cut most certainly did not save the film. Interestingly, there may have been even more stuff that was left out. In the interviews, just as filming was about to start, Scott said the film was meant to begin with a young Napoleon having a snowball fight at the military academy, but whether this was filmed or ditched early, we do not know. During filming, when the cast wasn't yet fully known, a young actress named Thea Achillea was listed on the IMDb as playing Napoleon's daughter, although this has since been removed. However, a bit of digging does turn up some images of her in costume, suggesting there was going to be a plotline about him having an illegitimate daughter or something. Of course, he probably didn't have one, so who knows where that was going to go. There may also have been a few extra sequences since, during filming for the Russian campaign, you can see the men standing with their muskets out, like the column is under attack, whilst Napoleon rides along. Other than that, this is probably all we were going to get. And boy, was it a disaster. Thank you for listening. This has been The Laughing Cavalier, wishing you a good day.